Louder is a series all about the relationship between words and actions. And that makes it also about the relationship between our head and our heart. It's easy for faith to set up shop in our brains, to know the stories, but the challenge of being a church today is to be bigger than the words. Over the weeks leading up to Easter, we will be looking at stories that will be familiar to people who have grown up in church. But within each story is a declaration, words that imply actions, buried with the key to unlocking the story itself. Louder focuses on those declarations and asks what we can learn about our own faith today because the same spirit that inspired the words of scripture lives and moves in our church today. So as we come to the word of God this morning, may we listen with more than just our ears. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. This can be found on page 635 in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bible. Reading from Isaiah, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook as the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of the hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. I have to confess that one of the one of the things about this about being tasked with preaching every week is that uh, some sermons are easier to write than others. Oftentimes, when you have a passage that uh, that feels in in the in the in, at a first glance or at a first pass like it begs to be to be preached, those are the sermons that we wrestle with the most. This was one of those sermons for me. Back in the fall, as we were preparing uh, in, for what to do in worship through the, the, through the first part of 2018, we knew that we wanted to spend some intentional time talking about this ministry and this mission that we we're called to south of Fish Creek and how, as a, what, what, as a church, the, were the questions that we needed to, needed to address? What were the concerns that we needed to raise? What were the issues that we needed to bring up? And as I was driving home one day just before Christmas, three words came to mind. Here I am. So I went home and I read this morning's scripture reading. And then I read it again. And then I read it a third time. It strikes me as a deeply personal and as a a deeply universal story, which is rare, I think, to find. A story that's that both touches me on a personal level, but also feels like it was directly inspired or directly written to us as a church in 2018 to figure out what God might be saying to the church is usually more of a struggle for me to answer the question, so what? I usually wrestle more with what wisdom can I bring to a congregation that's heard this story before or that story or what new can I, can I bring or what, what, what light can I possibly shed to people who have been in this game a lot longer than I have. For me, the struggle with this passage was not that, but was actually what does it take to bring us to the point 
where like Isaiah, we can experience the God of mission, the God who is deeply, personally, and corporately missional. And let that missional God affect, change, shape, and move us out to be the people that God has called us to be where God has called us to be. And as I read, and as I, so truthfully, I wrote this morning's passage, this morning's message three different times. Um, and each time, there was one prayer that I, that I, that I read from uh, the journal of Sir Francis Drake in 1577 that stuck with me. I want to share this prayer with you this morning. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have become true because we have dreamed too little. When we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore, disturb us, Lord, when the abundance of things we possess have caused us to lose our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life when we have ceased to dream of eternity and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hope and to push us into the future in strength, hope, and love. To me, this feels like a deeply missional prayer. It feels very much like the prayer that Isaiah offers in this morning's reading but it doesn't feel like a prayer that I can pray. When was the last time I prayed to be disturbed or to be led to new horizons? Even even the confessions of Francis Drake seem to resound with a holy boldness that I can only imagine. I don't pray like this. I, I pray like someone who loves stability, who enjoys control, not like someone who wants to find stars or wants to be led into storms. My tendency is to look at the world around me and see how big it is and, and feel overwhelmed and, and, and let that overwhelm become part of my identity. And so in that worldview, at best, my prayers become transactional moments where I relate to God horizontally and I can, I can say to him, You have blessed me without me having to ask you for any of it. You have given to me and you have been good to me and you have been generous to me out of nothing but a sheer sense of your goodness and your mercy and your love and for that I am thankful. But for the most part, that's where my prayers end. And as a minister who seeks to be a missional leader, I shouldn't be okay with that. None of us should be okay with praying like that. Because the great question of our age is a question that Isaiah directly addresses. Does the church matter anymore? Do we have anything to offer to the world that seeks something? Do we have hope that cannot be found anywhere else? Do we have joy that is contagious? Do we have love that is self-defining? Because I think truthfully, those, each of those words get watered down and get passed around and get used and reused and recycled and revamped in a hundred different ways time and time again. You can be part of a community that only meets online and you can be committed as one organization is solely to the purpose of decreasing world suck and in 36 hours with a community of 2 million millennials raise nearly $4 million to build wells in Africa, to build hospitals in Sierra Leone, and to make the world suck a little bit less. What does the church have to offer in a world like that? For me, I think I wrestle with this passage because I desperately, in my own life, want to change the way I I interact with God. 
I desperately want to change the, the nature of my relationship with God from one that is horizontal and transaction-based whether it's me asking God to help me through a hard time or me saying to, or me simply expressing to God the sheer, utter thankfulness I have for everything in my life, I want to shift that relationship to one that's vertical, to one that, where that recognizes the, the prayer and the, the character and the humility of Isaiah. Because for Isaiah, that is the shift that happens, I think. And I think for what, what lets Francis Drake pray with the boldness and the bigness and the greatness and the, and the poetry with which he prays, I think it's because he's properly ordered his relationship with God. I think he sees God bigger than I do. I think he sees God more holy than I do. I think he, sees, he, he hears God's leading more clearly than I do. Because now, like then, the community of faith was facing an identity crisis. In Isaiah's day, the question the people were asking was, did the people of God have anything to offer the world anymore? Worship was seldom attended in the, at the temple. People were, would put almost every, any, anything else ahead of their religious commitments, and the temple occupied a hefty chunk of real estate where people would simply walk past its doors without really thinking about why it featured so prominently in the Jerusalem skyline. (laughs) Then, like now, though, God was preparing the people for a mission. And people of mission need big prayers. I think that both Francis Drake and Isaiah pray the same thing, but in radically different ways. Francis Drake writes poetry Isaiah, in a different tact, offers three, a, a three-word prayer. But it's three words that both start and end his conversation with God. Because did you notice where Isaiah has his vision? It's there, it's hidden, and, and, all, and it's easy to skip past. But Isaiah reminds us that his vision happens while he is in the temple. That while Isaiah is in church, he experiences God in a new way. That he encounters God in a, in a way that he never has before. And this is the same Isaiah who for six chapters, for who knows how long, has been preaching, has been standing in front of kings and rulers, has, been, has confronted the wealthy and the powerful, and called them to account for the way that they treat each other and the world. And, and yet he still has not encountered an ex- or experienced God in the way that he has. So for me, I see good news in this. Because to me, it says that wherever we are in our life, wherever we are in our faith journey, wherever we are in our relationship with this community and this faith family, it means that God is not done with us yet. It means that whether we're 8 or 88, that God still has the ability to break into every one of our lives with a, with a message and a calling to mission in big and in bold ways. Here I am is, is the start of it because Isaiah simply shows up. He does what is uncommon in his world and shows up for worship. Because it's in worship that we, encounter, that we create opportunities to encounter God. That we, we, we set ourselves up for, those, for the moments where God can show us in real and in powerful ways. It's through the, through the, through the act of joining in silent prayer together. It's through the, the ability to, to join and to stand and to sing. It's through the, the hearing of God's word explained and through the administration of the sacraments that we create moments and opportunities to encounter God in a new and powerful way. Philosophers and anthropologists who study religion draw a distinction between the two kinds of phenomena explained here they outline them as the difference between an experience with God and an encounter with God. An experience is akin to watching watching one of those uh, uh, car accident PSAs that used to be on TV, you know, where the the crash test dummy would be thrown in super slow motion through the windshield so you could watch and you could take in all the information about how important it was to wear your seatbelt. An encounter, however, 
was is to have been in the car as the, as 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 flat as steel and and fabric wrap themselves around you. It's the difference between watching a car accident happen and being in a car accident. Every encounter begins with experience, but not every experience leads to encounter. And so our obligation as people of faith, as people seeking God's leading, is to create and to guide and to bring ourselves into as many opportunities to experience God as we possibly can because these, those experiences will lead us to encounters. Here I am is the... Here I am is the... Is the uh, here I am is the declaration that we are going to show up. It's the declaration that we're going to show up, but, then it's, the, but it's also the declaration that we don't need to be in control. And that, for me, is, my, is where I struggle. Because as I said, I love that part of it. I want to manufacture my experiences. I want to, I want to reproduce and, and mass market the experiences and the encounters that have affected me and that that have drawn me closer to, to God. The things, the people, the places, the times that have shaped me and, and made me who I am. But properly encountering God as Isaiah does leads us to the point of recognizing that in a vertical relationship with God, we're not at the center. That in a vertical relationship with God, words themselves fail us. In a vertical relationship with God, we experience God as he really is, and we are left with, this, with a simple declaration that we, woe is me, says Isaiah, for I am undone. Undone, English doesn't begin to describe or to, 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 to encapsulate everything that, I, that Isaiah is experiencing and exploring here. To be undone means to be, in, in Hebrew, to be rent to the very soul, to be, to be split into, into all of your tiny pieces, to be holy and, and perfectly deconstructed. To stand, to stand before God is to see yourself in all of your parts and to have those laid before you and to realize that by whatever standard you want to measure those, you are wholly inadequate for whatever task God has called you to. And so, you, and so, you rec- and so recognizing that in, our, in ourselves, we confess and we, pl- we place that before God and say, I am broken. I cannot do this for myself. I have no hope being in myself. I have no hope in my strength. But at the same time, to hear the good news that nothing plus everything will always be enough. God, can, God puts Isaiah back together from his, he recreates him wholly and totally and perfectly and beautifully from nothing into something. He fills a broken vessel with infinity and lets the overflow lead Isaiah into mission. I've wanted to preach this passage because I think that the message of Isaiah is a message that the church wrestles and struggles still with today. We are a people of unclean lips living among a people of unclean lips. We're broken people trying to minister to broken people. We're imperfect beings loving, serving, ministering to, and, and, and praying on behalf of imperfect beings. On our own, we cannot be a missional church. On our own, we cannot do the work that God is calling us to. On our own, we can't even imagine or fathom the opportunities and the the work that God has placed before us. But if we reorient our relationship with God, if we move from a horizontal, transactional relationship where our prayers are based on our needs and our prayers are based on thanksgiving and our prayers are based on on a transactional equality with God and reorient that radically toward an understanding of God that says you are bigger and more holy and greater and more powerful and more, more indescribable than anything I can fathom, then God will put us back together. 
And once God has put us back together, he can place before us the mission that he is calling us to. And once again with Isaiah, we can say the words that we lived before. We can say that we can put into, into action the words that were, simply our, uh, that, were simply, that were as simple as showing up before. We can say to God once and for all, here I am, send me. For Isaiah, the choice was simple. He knew that if God wanted him to change the world, that God needed to change him first. So Isaiah answers the great question of our age by reminding us that the church only matters if the church is filled with people who are willing to say, here I am. Disturb me, Lord, when, we are, when I am too well pleased with myself. When my dreams have have been too well pleased with myself when my dreams have come true because I have dreamed too little. When I arrive safely because I have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb me, Lord, when the abundance of things I, when in the abundance of things I possess I have lost my thirst for the waters of life. And having fallen in love with life I have ceased to dream of eternity. And in my efforts to build a new earth, I have allowed my vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb me, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. I ask you to push back the horizons of my hope and push me into the future in strength, hope, and love, for here I am. Amen. Let us respond to God's goodness and grace through the giving of his tithe and our offerings this morning.